first of all, thank you uh, for coming. Welcome to the new school. Um, I am Fabio Parasecoli. I'm actually... Well, no, that was my great-grandfather in that picture. <laughs> in Rome in the 1930s. Um, it's a family picture I found recently, and I decided to put it in the book because it's really, it's really a nice picture. The guy with the big uh, mustache, yeah. So this was during fascism in Rome, in the market in the neighborhood where I still live, uh, near the Vatican. But so thank you for coming for uh, presentation. This is th the first presentation of my book. Um, I'm very happy to have also two other very distinguished guests. Uh, on my right, Lisa Sasson. Uh, she's a uh, professor on nutrition at uh, NYU, at the Department of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health. And as she will tell you, we've traveled a lot in Italy together. We sort of, I helped her run a program for students in Italy for quite a few years. So she's got lots of experience of Italian food. And on my left, we have Sarah Jenkins, the chef at uh, Porsena and Porchetta in the East Village. Um, some of you apparently know the places. They are both fantastic. And um, she spent a lot of time in Italy. Actually, she just told us she's going on Friday um, for a while. <laughs> so um, we'll just keep it very, very simple. Uh, I want this to be a chat about Italian food and you know what it means and also why I wrote this book. I mean, there are so many books about Italian food. And so while I'm presenting this, the first question I get is like, why? I mean, there was need for another, another book. And as a matter of fact, um, I think in a way I tried to do something that had not been uh, done before, at least like this. Um, there are, yes, many, many books about Italian history and the, the history of Italian food. Um, what I wanted to do is actually allow the general readers to have access to research and uh, documents and material that usually either is not accessible because it's in Italian or maybe it's in scientific journals, so it needs, you know, sort of to be broken down and put in a more accessible language. So already from that point of view, I think it's, it's an interesting book. Also, the publisher asked me to write from the beginning of Italian food, so before the Greeks and the Etruscans and the Romans, to the contemporary times, which was extremely scary because as if you know the field a little bit, you know, people tend to focus on a specific period. Uh, he wanted me to give, you know, an overview, at least an overview also of antiquity, which is not really my field. Um, and more of a contemporary uh, stuff person. So, but, but it was very interesting because it really pushed me to do research myself. And so I found out interesting stuff. I started looking at archaeologists' um, research, for instance, on the Chianina beef in Tuscany. Uh, they've done DNA analysis, and they found that uh, probably that, that breed of cows is connected with the breed of cows in Western Turkey, which is an indication that maybe, as some scholars suggest, the Etruscans did come from Western Turkey into Italy around the 12th, 10th century before Christ. And they've actually started doing DNA analysis using the human genome. So we're gonna figure out where Italians come from, or at least certain groups of Italians, which is a very interesting topic in itself because, you know, as you might know, Italy stuck right in the middle of the Mediterranean. So everybody has pass by uh, and stayed more or less uh, long periods of time. Uh, and I think that's one of <clears throat> the elements that I also wanted to point out. Um, when we talk about Italian food, sometimes there is the tendency of thinking about it as something that it's coherent, it's something that, you know, there is Italian food, it makes sense. 
It actually doesn't. Um, even talking of the food in that area as Italian food requires a lot of <clears throat> uh, choices, uh, interpreting things. Uh, until 150 years ago, most people would not refer to themselves as Italian. Italy, it's a very young country. Uh, we celebrated 150 years of the Italian unification in uh, 2000, 2011. 2011. It's in 61, exactly. So uh, the, the very expression Italian food is something new. And this is particularly clear, for instance, for uh, descendants of Italian immigrants in this country where people did not really identify themselves as Italians, but they were rather Sicilians or Neapolitans or other things. Because at the time when they came, Italy was a young thing and probably was not part of their experience. It's, it's something new. So what it means that now we look at this very diverse, very complicated uh, landscape of food at something that is unified. I think, in a way, the very fact that we look at it as a unified thing changes its nature. By thinking it as Italian, we make it Italian. And people make choices um, accordingly. Certain dishes that, until the unification, were not Italian, now are the quintessential Italian dishes. Uh, pasta with tomato sauce. Until the end of the 19th century, not many people outside the area of Naples were even exposed to pasta with tomato sauce. It was something that was extremely local. Uh, pizza, same thing. You know, pizza, everybody thinks it's, you know, the quintessential Italian food. That's also something from the south. Uh, polenta, now it's becoming, you know, f fashionable risotto. Those are dishes from the north. And in Italy, we still perceive them as northern, as a matter of fact, even if we make them at home. I'm from Rome, from the center. Um, but we still have very specific, you know, dishes and traditions. I remember growing up, I had never tasted pumpkin because in Rome, we didn't eat pumpkin that much. It was not part of, you know, what I traditionally ate. And then when I started traveling to Tuscany, I found out that many Tuscans are not used to eat eggplants, which for me it's a very um, normal, normal food. And it's funny because Tuscany, I mean, for instance, Florence and Rome are like one, one hour and a half from each other by train. So Italy, it's, it, it, it's very small. I also wanted to sort of break down this idea of Italian food. And so I called the book A History of Food in Italy another history of Italian food. Um, because historically, we've seen Italy has been exposed to influences from all over the place. We talked about the Etruscans, the Greeks, but we have the Arabs, we have the Normans from uh, Northern Europe, and then we have the Spaniards and the French, everybody who could you know, get a piece of that uh, took advantage of it. So historically, we have to recognize that Italian foodways or foodways in Italy uh, are the result of this very complicated uh, interactions. And nowadays, we cannot talk about Italian food without looking at the diaspora. So all the Italians that have moved away from Italy and now live in other places, and at the same time, uh, the presence of foreigners in Italy. Which is, which is very complicated. When we talk of diaspora, especially in this country, we just you know, think about Italian-American communities, but there are huge Italian communities uh, in Argentina, uh, in Brazil, uh, in many other countries in, in Northern Europe. So over time, the presence of these communities have brought certain dishes, certain traditions also in these other uh, places. And, they have been influenced, but they've also influenced um, the local ways of eating. 
At the same time, Italian food travels also without Italian immigrants. It's becoming increasingly popular. And so I, in the book, I also talk of something that here maybe it's not well known, but it's very popular in Japan. It's called wafu pasta. Uh, here in New York, we have one restaurant near here, actually. It's called Basta Pasta. So wafu pasta, it's pasta, but made in a Japanese style with Japanese ingredients and Japanese techniques. And it's very, very interesting. Now, you know, if you look at uh, websites, uh, cooking websites in, in Japan, they have recipes of wafu pasta, you have books about wafu pasta, it's extremely popular. At the same time, to understand today and to see the future of Italian food, you also have to think about all the immigrant communities that now are in Italy. It's a recent, uh, relatively recent phenomenon. We didn't have uh, large immigrant communities until more or less the 70s. Uh, until the 70s, Italians were still migrating, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> Maybe not to the US any longer, but there was still a very strong migration towards Germany, towards Belgium, uh, northern France, all the places where Italians could work, could work in mines or in factories, uh, or open restaurants, of course. Uh, but now we have larger and larger communities of immigrants in Italy, and Italians don't really know how to deal with it. Actually, also due to the economic crisis, there is a certain xenophobic uh, backlash. There are tensions, and sometimes the tension gets expressed through food too. A few years ago, and that's one of my favorite examples, uh, in the north of Italy, a party that uh, would like to succeed from the rest of Italy, it's called the Northern League, uh, put out posters saying, uh, yes to polenta, no to couscous. <laughs> and they organized public festivals on the streets where they would make polenta in the local style with the local cheese to underline you know, their identity. This is our food, we don't want anything to do with couscous. Little they know, couscous was present in Italy much earlier than polenta <laughs> because the Arabs were there in southern Italy in the 9th century, 10th century. Uh, to this day, uh, couscous in western Sicily is one of the local specialties. Um, especially seafood uh, couscous is fantastic in Erice. Um, polenta just came in the 16th century after Columbus came to, to the Americas. So I, I think having a historical reflection of food is important today also for political reasons. And that's why I use a good chunk of my book to talk about today and trying to understand today by looking back. Because in Italy now, the, the cultural and political discussion can get pretty nasty. And I think it's important also as, you know, as a scholar and before then as a food critic, I used to be a food critic for many years, it's important to participate in this debate and sort of clarify certain misconceptions, at least you know, to take away ammunition from the most uh, bigoted xenophobic discourse that you can, um, that you can find. So th that's it, you know, I, I wanted to to look at my own history in a way, but also the history of this very complicated country in its global aspects. And uh, I decided to, uh, to write the book, which, you know, as any book requires work, especially when English is not your first language, as you can hear from my accent. But at the same time, they gave me the opportunity to have access, I don't know, to 15th century uh, culinary books that, you know, are, have not been translated into English. So I could translate pieces of that, um, even if dealing with ancient Italian is not always fun, but it was extremely interesting. Of course, my point of view is the point of view of an Italian, but also an Italian that has been living abroad for most of his adult life. I've been living here in the U.S. since 98, and before that, I've 
let's say I was traveling around uh, <laughs> in a previous life. Um, but so in a way, I'm emotionally attached to that food. That food is my food. It's the way I, you know, I grew up, and it's the food I still enjoy cooking. But at the same time, I think after 16 years, 20 years, I can also look at it, you know, with a certain uh, distance and try to have a more objective uh, approach to it. So I, enough of my chatting. I would like to have Sarah talk about his experiences in Italy and what it means for an American who's lived in Italy for long periods, though, to cook Italian food. And what sort of Italian food do you choose? How do you make the menu? What are your inspirations? There's this whole discourse of authenticity. How do you feel about it? Okay, so my background's a little unusual. I moved to Italy when I was eight. My parents bought a farmhouse in the countryside in a depre an economically depressed zone, hard to believe today. Um, and my neighbors had basically gotten electricity the year before. So they were all still incredibly um, <clears throat> rural and living off the land. Uh, in fact, the first couple summers, there was a wheat harvest. Everybody grew wheat uh, and grapes and olives and then their vegetables and raised animals. And this is literally what they lived off of day in and day out. And the first couple summers, they still had the traditional harvest. There was one combine harvester that went from house to house. And the men spent all day throwing the sheaves of wheat into the machine. And the women spent all day cooking. And at the end, everybody sat down and ate. And then out came the accordion. And you know, everybody danced the night away. And that was it. And that was, you know, that was kind of my introduction. And I came there. Um, I, I, I'm 100% American as much as any of us are, I guess, but uh, I never lived here until I was 15. So it's not as though I came from suburban America and experienced this. I'd already been living in pretty rural areas of the Mediterranean. So I never really thought about it. I just accepted it. That's the way it was, you know? And um, eventually I moved to the States when I was 15 to go to school and I was, I kind of couldn't eat. I had never been that interested in food. I just, I didn't recognize the food and I would go down to like Little Italy in Boston and I didn't, I didn't recognize the food and people, they're like, isn't this great? It's Italian food. And you're like, I don't know what this is, but I've never seen it before. <laughs> um, <laughs> Eventually, I fell into cooking, and I fell into cooking at a point when, in America, people were just beginning to abandon Italo-American cuisine and venerate Northern Italian, right? That was fancy, and I was lucky because, you know, I spent my time in uh, Tuscany and in Rome, and I really had a first-hand understanding of ingredients and the seasonality of what happened. So. I became an Italian chef, um, and I wound up going back to Italy for about three years at one point in the 90s and working and paying at least a little more attention to what was going on with the food because as a kid, I just didn't think about it, right? And um, <clears throat> authenticity is a, is a question that I struggle with all the time. Uh, when I worked in Florence in a Tuscan restaurant, we had to produce Florentine food. That meant that something like cachuco, which is a regional seafood stew from the coast, wasn't part of the cuisine or the menu. Um, and that was so incredibly, ultimately, uh, like a prison in some ways to me, because as a non-native Tuscan, um, I appreciate the breadth of Italian food, and I'm, I'm intrigued and fascinated by it, and I love to go to Sicily and hunt around and kind of think about, you know, pine nuts and raisins, is that identifying this dish as being something that comes from the Arab tradition, and where did this come from, and, and where did that, and I, authenticity is something that I struggle with all the time. But what I really shoot for is to honor Italian food traditions, which for me are a respect for ingredients, the seasonality of ingredients, and 
you know, when I first came to New York, I was one of a few chefs who shopped at the green market. And green market shopping is now a fetish. And it's a fetish about locavorism and, and all this stuff. And you know what? Honestly, I don't care about locavorism. I care that at the green market, the food is the best tasting food I can possibly get my hands on. And is that because it's like fresh and local? Probably. But um, it, so it's, it's really not, you get bogged up in this political statement of being at the green market, and it's really just like a greedy gastronomic um, reason for me. Uh, and so, you know, one of the examples I use to talk about authenticity, um, sweet corn is not something Italians eat. Even though they embraced corn and corn as animal feed and polenta, actually growing corn and putting butter on it and sitting there and eating it as a dish is still not something. You just, you don't get sweet corn there. Um, but I like to cook in the summer in New England with corn and I make corn pasta because it is, it's fresh, it's, it's from nearby, it's what's in season, it's what we want to celebrate in a way that I wouldn't do that in Italy, you know? And I've watched, I've watched a friend of mine bring in product from Italy, like the most gorgeous little baby wild greens and stuff like that in an attempt to be authentic. And somehow I feel there's something really un-Italian in it. Like if I have to bring the product halfway around the world on a plane. Um, I think my most challenging authentic <laughs> food Italian experience was traveling in India and being asked to prepare um, pasta and teach the woman how to make pasta. And I knew that Parmesan cheese was just not a possibility, right? So, okay, <laughs> we can't have a cheese pasta. And I was like, well, but do you have olive oil? You know, well, I'm going to get olive oil. So he came back from the market with this can of olio sasso, which is just vile. And <laughs> I had to make the pasta, and I made the pasta. I could st even at the end, I could smell the olive oil, how awful it was. But fine, he didn't know. And I kept saying, listen, pasta, you know, when it's done, because we're eating dinner every night, and all this Indian food would get put on a lazy Susan and sit at the table, and everybody grabs a little of this and a little of that and spins it around. And, put, and not pasta, you know, it comes out, you got to eat it, right? Got to eat it right away. It's got to go down in front of people. Everybody has to eat it. They put the pasta on the Lazy Susan. They spun it around. They put a little duck and green peppercorn curry on the plate. They put a little pasta on the plate. They put a little turmeric rice on the plate. I just gave up, you know? But they were thrilled. They were thrilled. That, that's something that I experience also sometimes when I cook here and people come over and are like, is that Italian food? And I'm like, oh, I guess, I don't know, it's what I cook. So, and it's very interesting from that point of view. I wanted to ask you, how did people react to porchetta? So, porchetta is this, you can describe it better than I can, but, you know, many people here have sort of a revulsion about fat. How did they... Fortunately, apparently, we've moved beyond that, and yes. fat is our new friend. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, people love pork. People really, really love pork here. And so for that, I knew that porchetta would work. That porchetta would be, if nothing else, it would work as a pork sandwich, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've never really had anybody complain Fantastic. about the fat, maybe. I've had people say that it's the worst pulled pork sandwich they've ever had. <laughs> And I, I have to agree, I don't doubt it's probably the worst pulled pork sandwich you've ever had because it's not a pulled pork sandwich. Um, you know, there was a funny thing that happened when we opened that right as the market crashed, and so it was like this cheap gourmet treat when yeah. everybody's counting their pennies. Um, but, you know, we've done a lot of... Um, we just put a porchetta bun me on the menu, so oh. <laughs> we we play around over there in oh, a way that good. we might not be able to in Italy. <laughs> well, to transition to Lisa, I remember a couple of times we brought students to eat ham, and we took them to the ham production places. And some of the students were a little taken aback. First of all, by the realization that you actually have to deal with blood to make <laughs> ham, uh, prosciutto. And the fact that people actually ate the fat. And some, some of the students had to s struggle, right? Oh, I, I, I'm having a problem getting my mic out. It 
Can everyone hear me if I don't use the mic? No, 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 no. okay. Um, yeah, I think that students were used to buying meat in a supermarket and not associating the animal with the meat product and that it was very sterile and I remember how repulsed they were when we went to the main markets and they saw every part of the animal and you know the head of the chicken, the claws, the claws of animals and they just were repulsed and they were gagging and they couldn't believe people ate this and they couldn't believe that they were eating those products of an animal because it looked so perfect in the saran wrap in Wallbaums that they just there was this disconnect and I think that that was a you know a, something that they learned to appreciate and I thought it was a very important thing that people should know where their food comes from not only our vegetables but our animals and, and poultry and Lisa actually observed the changes in behavior of the students. Uh, during and after the trip, you want to yeah, talk about that? Yeah, this was very that. interesting. What happened is I take students to Italy for three weeks, and we, we go all over Italy, so it's not just in Tuscany, and it's because of exactly what Sarah and Fabio were telling you, the cuisine is so regional, so um, it's so important to see more than Tuscany, the typical Tuscany Rome, but we, we go down south and up north. And so many interesting things were happening because students were learning about nutrition, health, public policy, culinary practices, and I'm very interested in the Mediterranean diet because that has formed the basis of a healthy diet plan. So we look at the history of how was the Mediterranean diet perceived to be, why is it healthy, what were the, the basis for it. And what was really funny is the students came to Italy to understand more about Italian food culture, but something I noticed was they were learning so much more about their own food culture and food practices. So this is what um, prompted me to do some research, and I did some preliminary research. The students were asked to ask many, answer many different questions about their own shopping habits, dining habits, um, food purchasing habits, eating habits prior to the trip. And then when they returned from this three-week food immersion program, I asked them the same questions. And then six months later, that was very important because you know when everyone comes back from Italy, they buy, want to have a Tuscan kitchen and they want to, everything's <laughs> Italy and they just spend all day in Italy, although Italy didn't exist then. I really wanted to wait six months and see were there any changes in your own eating habits, uh, shopping habits, um, relationship with fat, olive oil, because in Italy you just put olive oil on everything, um, after you returned home six months later. And it was really interesting because the three things that changed, at least that was statist statistically significant, was students had more wine with their meals. So why is that important? Not that I take students to Italy to get them drunk, but... Uh, <laughs> I kind of had to explain that to my chair. Don't worry, that's not the role of this program. But that served to me as a proxy that you're sitting down and having a meal. Because so many of the students don't eat meals. And that was something that students really learned in Italy, was you take time to have a meal. Because prior to the trip, when I asked students, what is a meal to you? A meal to many students was just eating anything, walking down the street, you know, drinking some you know, beverage. The whole idea of a meal was not necessarily sitting down with a knife, knife and fork, a social experience. So that was important because I know very few people walk down the street drinking wine with their meal. <laughs> the second thing was that they were cooking more. And we do go to culinary school when we're in Italy and it is in Florence. And I think the hallmark of the Tuscan cuisine is the simplicity of the cuisine. And that is something that's certainly reinforced in this culinary school because most dishes are really only four or five ingredients and they're so tasty and delicious and you don't use 25 cloves of garlic. <laughs> and the reason is that they use fresh ingredients. They use herbs. And because everything's so fresh and local, it tastes delicious. You don't have to smother it in sauces or you don't have to use tons of other spices. And when they went to the culinary school, they cooked around three different uh, recipes, and it was amazing. They cooked something known as nudi, which is like, um, which is ravioli, which without the shell. And they cooked a pesto sauce and fresh pasta, and they made all these dishes. And each dish was four or five ingredients. They did it with their own hands. 
And I think that encouraged them to cook more. Like they realize, why am I so intimidated to cook? It really, it really changed their relationship with food. The other thing, although this was a long time ago, this project, and now open air markets and uh, farmers markets are so mo much more common, it, in Italy, all cities have open air markets. It's, it's historic, that's the way people shopped, it was the way people communicated, you got the town gossip. And students were so intrigued with the open air markets. They're much better even than they are here because they've been so established. And when students came back, they started to go to open air markets. Um, and the main reason was because that's where you know what's in season. See, Italians know what's in season. They wouldn't eat an artichoke out of season because you can't get them. It's not that they were so sustainable. They just couldn't get artichokes. It's not like here. And so the students were relying on open air markets, not only for the quality of the food, but because they know that food is grown here now. It's not being imported. And so you're going to get a really delicious, good quality product. And it's interesting, uh, I also teach Italians in Italy, and I see that the youngest kids, I don't know if you've noticed that, uh, they have to learn about Italian food and about Italian traditions because uh, somehow the, the direct transmission within the family doesn't work any longer as it used to, for many reasons, you know, economic reasons, mothers uh, working outside uh, during the day, they don't feel like, you know, cooking too much or cooking complicated dishes, or they don't want to teach how to cook, especially their daughters, because maybe they don't have a very good relationship with the fact that they were stuck in the kitchen. So there has been some problems from that point of view in terms of uh, transmissions. But at the same time, now food is so uh, present in the media, then you see young kids that want to learn about, about the food. We also have uh, an Italian edition of Master Chef, which is extremely popular and has brought many young people to, back to food, but how? What kind of idea of food do they have? Because that's a competition. It's, you know, it's TV, it's a show. How much does that become part of their daily experience of their, you know, the fact that I come back home, I have a flower, I whip up something instead of ordering in. Things are, are changing, but while they're changing, people are also very aware that they're changing and they're trying to figure out how to deal with that. I don't know if you've seen this transformation over time. Well, well, we watched our neighbors go from eating basically the same food day in and day out with, you know, a certain amount of variety on a festa day. Maybe they make a lasagna and, you know, artichoke season, they're going to eat artichokes and eggplant season, they're going to eat eggplant. But uh, they pretty much nothing changed. And it came through two things. It came through television. So now we're watching TV and we're seeing other people do other things, even if it's an ad for, you know, heart healthy corn oil, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then also getting off the farm more and getting out into town and bringing home sauces so that now I'm just as lucky to be, I'm just as lucky, I'm just as likely to be served a pasta bought at a shop in the store and served with some like awful cream truffle sauce um, as opposed to what I'd really like to be served which is the handmade pasta with the eggs from their own chickens. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've, I've seen that. It's, it's the problem of time. And yet what I loved when I came from Italy to here, all of my Italian friends from the most sexist like guy to the girliest girl could make themselves a decent meal. They weren't gourmet cooks. They weren't sitting around watching TV shows or reading cookbooks, but by God, they could make themselves pasta and a plate of, and a salad and, and call it a day, you know? And my friends here couldn't boil water, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's that. <laughs> from your personal point of view, mm -hmm. what have you brought back from all your time in Italy and... Personally? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's from, a great... From the food point of view. Oh, 
<laughs> You're not talking about all the clothes? The shoes? Oh, I thought you wanted to know the shoes I got. Um, <laughs> um, well, you see, I, I look at it through the lens of a nutritionist because although I do see changes, and I've seen it over the many years I've been running this program, I still think there is a food culture in, in Italy. I know there's changes and it's not what mm -hmm. you remember, but I still, I wish America was like Italy is today. And I just fear that window, that America is more like a window of the future. And if there aren't changes in Italy, it will become like America. Um, so the things I saw is the concept of a meal. I mean, that's something, the importance of a meal, the social aspect of a meal. I still think that does exist in Italy. I, I know it's changing, but it really does, where you sit down, not walking down the street and eating. That still exists in Italy. Mm. You really, except for gelato, I don't think you see people that are walking down the street and eating. Um, and it's the importance of using good quality ingredients, which is something, you know, like the best, even if you have to spend more for a good quality olive oil, it's gonna make your meal taste so much better. And you don't have to add a lot of other ingredients. So for me, these, you know, the, the simplicity of good, ingredients. I, I want to make one point though because we talk about this a lot and my mother goes on and on about this <laughs> about how Europeans spend 30 percent of their income on food and Americans don't. Right. But Europeans also don't spend money on health insurance and don't spend money on higher education and I think that's a huge difference that has to be taken into consideration. That's true. Perhaps if we had free health insurance and higher education <laughs> we could also spend 30 percent of our disposable income. That's true. <laughs> Good point. But, uh, I mean, in a way, what, what you're saying about the, the, the meal, I think that's still there. Definitely. I can see also, you know, uh, now when we work, we don't have time to go home for a meal or uh, a nap, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, we tend to go out together and, and eat together. Even if we're going Definitely. to some place, it, it's not so much, you know, eating in front of the computer. Right. There is still this sense that... You know, there is something positive about uh, eating together. And, you know, when there are important uh, occasions, you do share meals. Absolutely. That's the most important thing. I mean, in addition, the role wine plays in the Italian mm. diet. Um, you know, one of our friends who's in the program says wine is like food for Italians. And in a way, it's true. Wine is a part of the meal. So I think that's something very important, that you don't drink go home and drink three glasses of wine on an empty stomach, that's very un-Italian, that you though have your wine with your meal. That's part of the meal. It would be missing, lunchtime, dinner. And that's still not that American. Like, I can't imagine if we went out for lunch <laughs> at work, anyone would get wine. Mm -hmm. I always feel incredibly decadent drinking wine at lunch in America. I know. And I know. really weird right. if I don't have wine with lunch in Italy. You right. Know, I wouldn't like, think to or, I wouldn't think not to have wine in Italy. Exactly. And here I wouldn't that people at work would think I'm a lush. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and in Italy it's like water. It just goes with your meal. And it's so funny how when I get to Italy, the minute I land, I just do all the Italian I make sure all my students know after ten o'clock you're not allowed to have cappuccino. You're not allowed to put Parmesan cheese on seafood. There are certain Italian rules. I said, when in Italy, you really got to respect the Italian culture. So, um, and then when you are in Italy, it just seems so right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I think we'll continue less formally. We'll be mulling around. You've got uh, food outside. Drinks are going to be here. Uh, the book is also available on sale for $25. Uh, thank you again to Sarah and Lisa. If you want to hang out and talk to the guests, that's great. Thank you. Thank you.